Hi, I'm Juliet, and today I'm going to be talking to you about oxidative stress and inflammation, or inflammation and oxidative stress, and how it may be playing a role, or most likely is playing a role, in your type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Before we begin, I would just like to let you know that I have developed a diabetes lifestyle coaching program. And if you are at all interested, then make sure you click on the link below to schedule a free consultation with myself to see whether it would be a good fit and it would be suitable for you. Okay, so inflammation and oxidative stress. So what exactly is oxidation? So oxidation is a normal process that occurs in our bodies as a result of chemical reactions taking place. So if you think of a, an apple, so an apple will undergo a certain amount of oxidation and then it ripens and then it goes through and there's more oxidation and there becomes too much oxidation and it becomes rancid or off. So a little bit of oxidation is okay in our bodies. A little bit of oxidation actually helps to stimulate our immune system and it also can stimulate the growth of new cells. But when we get too much oxidation, it becomes this imbalance and this can lead to inflammation and potentially disease or illness. So what is actually at the cause or what is causing this oxidation and um, oxidative stress? So free radicals are these molecules um, that are missing an electron. So a stable molecule is a happy molecule. It's got these electron pairs that um, gravitate around the molecule. So when they're in pairs, they're stable, they're happy, everything is great. A free radical, because they're missing that electron pair, they're highly unstable and they're very reactive. So these free radicals can go throughout your body and they wreak havoc. They can cause damage to your cells and your tissues and really um, can contribute to injury, but also this oxidative stress and inflammation. So an antioxidant is one that actually has a spare electron. So an antioxidant has a spare electron, it will donate it to the free radical or it will impart it on the free radical to help stabilize it. So the antioxidant will come along, it'll give the free electron that it's carrying to the free radical and the free radical will then become a nice stable molecule so it's not going to cause any problems. Now, when there is an imbalance, so when you have too many free radicals or not enough antioxidants, then you start to get this oxidative stress where your body is not coping very well and it's not able to put out or um, reduce the risk of these free radicals causing problems. So, as I said, it's normal physiological chemical reactions in our body will produce a small amount of free radicals, but normally we would have enough antioxidant capacity to basically uh, neutralize these free radicals so they don't cause any problems. So what, what are the other things or what are things that are in our environment or behaviors that will help um, well, in this case, I guess when we're talking about what will cause uh, this oxidative stress. So what will generate free radicals? What are things in our environment that will contribute to more free radical formation? And what are things that will reduce our antioxidant capacity? So this is our sort of defense against the free radicals. So one of the first things is lack of good nutrition. If you are not consuming these foods um, that contain antioxidants, then you're not, your defense system is completely down. So you don't have enough antioxidants to stabilize these free radicals. So they are causing havoc in your body, leading to oxidative stress, this chronic low-lying inflammation, which is at the root cause of many of these chronic diseases. So these diseases include type two diabetes, um, as I've said, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, depression, 
there are tons. Basically, all of these chronic diseases have this underlying inflammation and oxidative stress um, type of pathology. All right, so good nutrition or lack of good nutrition. Um, where do you get antioxidants from? So you get antioxidants from whole foods. So that is foods that have been minimally processed. When you start to process a food, you start to make those antioxidants vulnerable to oxidation themselves. And they can be lost or destroyed to the environment, to heat, to moisture, to the air. So, um, I mean, if you're thinking of an apple, you know, an apple over time will lose its antioxidant capacity. So if we alter that apple in some way, if we cut it, it's going to speed that process up. So when we start processing foods, we start to lose the antioxidant capacity. So antioxidants you get primarily from plant-based foods. So if you think of Mother Nature's foods, so the foods that Mother Nature has grown for us um, from the ground, you know, uh, in trees, in bushes, in um, veggie patches, that sort of thing. So all your vegetables, fruit, your legumes, your beans, seeds and nuts, they all contain these really powerful antioxidants that will help to uh, neutralize these free radicals. So diet is really, really important. Processed and refined foods. So we've sort of touched on that already. So the more you process these foods, the more you lose the antioxidant capacity. But often these foods will also have lots of artificial chemicals added back in. And these artificial chemicals are not, not um, well, they're foreign to our body and they can cause a lot of problems. And our body really, you know, has to try and get rid of them. And in some cases they can contribute to free radical forma formation, uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, and again, the cycle goes on. So trying to minimize your intake of these processed and refined foods. If you're not sure if it's processed or refined, is it packaged? If it's packaged, look at the ingredients list. If it's not packaged, then, um, well, I mean, you can still get processed and refined foods that haven't been packaged. Like if you go to McDonald's, for example, I mean, it does come in a package, but you can't look at the ingredients list on it. Um, but just think, where did this food come from? Has it been altered? Like, what does it actually normally look like when it's grown? How much has it been altered from its original form? Uh, but educating yourself about what process and refine is, is really important and understanding what a whole food is and why it is good for you, what's in it. Um, it's really important and it will make it a lot easier for you to make these decisions. So high blood sugars and high blood fats or diets high in refined sugar and fats and this, particularly these inflammatory fats like processed oils, so the oils that have been highly processed like your vegetable oil, um, but also saturated fat. If you have high cholesterol and high blood sugars at the same time in particular, uh, they can start contributing to inflammation in the body. So. If you have type 2 diabetes and your sugars are running high, they in themselves can contribute to oxidative stress and inflammation. So you can see it really is a cycle. We can go either way. So we want to try and minimize these foods that will cause blood sugar spikes. And we want to try and get on top of our blood sugars and keep our cholesterol down as well. So number four, environmental chemicals. So these are chemicals that are found just in our homes, uh, in our food. So things like pesticides and a lot of the chemicals that actually leach into our food from the packaging, particularly if they're plastic packaging and you're putting them in the microwave and things like that, then there's a much greater likelihood of these chemicals getting into your food. So all these environmental chemicals, some are a bit hard to avoid, but there are lots of things you can do to try and minimize your exposure to these chemicals. So, uh, I mean, eating organic can help. Uh, it doesn't eliminate environmental chemicals completely, but it definitely minimizes it. I know that organic food can sometimes be a little bit more expensive, but uh, there is, uh, I'll put it in the show notes, 
a, an organisation called EWG, the Environmental Working Group, and they put a list together every year of the foods that have the highest pesticide residues and the foods that are potentially um, lower in pesticides, so you can make the decision as to which, which foods you will um, you know, pay a little bit more for. So trying to minimise your exposures to environmental chemicals in your food, but also in your home. So the cleaning products and things you use are often, they contain, will mean they are chemicals. So trying to learn about what cleaning products are less toxic that you could be using in your home, so you're not exposing your family. Uh, as well as things like beauty products. So some beauty products, lots of beauty products do also have chemicals. So understanding which beauty products to be um, using if you are using any. Um, so there are definitely lots of things you can do to minimize your exposure to these environmental chemicals, although impossible to completely avoid them altogether unless you live in a little bubble. Number five, so smoking and alcohol. So these are definitely things that we've known for a long time that will uh, generate free radicals in the body and can contribute to oxidative stress, inflammation. Pollution, well, it's a little bit of a tricky one to avoid or minimize if you are particularly living in a population dense city but I guess you can you know, just be mindful of it and do your best. Stress can actually generate free radicals and oxidative stress in the body. Uh, lack of physical activity. So when you actually move your body, when you're exercising in the short term, particularly if it was a more strenuous workout, you do produce some free radicals because you, these chemical reactions are taking place in your body as you do exercise. Um, but at the same time, you're stimulating your body to produce its own antioxidant capacity. So the exercise is actually going to be helpful in reducing the oxidative stress and inflammation in the long term. So being physically active um, is going to be very helpful, but being physically inactive and if you're sitting around all day, then um, you're potentially increasing that risk of this oxidative stress building up in your body. Radiation, so radiation, I guess we don't hope, luckily most of us are not exposed to this very, very regularly. And the sun's UV rays. So I guess here in Australia, we have very hot, a very hot sun. So we do need to be mindful about when we're out in the sun and covering up in those really, um, when the UV rays are really high. So, you know, right around midday, but of course, we don't want to completely cover up and not get any sun because then we wouldn't be getting vitamin D, but just being mindful that we are a little bit sun smart. Okay, so I hope this has been helpful. And I, if you're thinking that, oh, that's easy, I'll just go and buy a whole bunch of antioxidant supplements and my, I'll be fine. It doesn't quite work like that. So if anything, I mean, this has been studied. There have been multiple or lots of studies done on antioxidant supplements and their uh, capacity to neutralize free radicals, prevent inflammation and disease. But if anything that's come out of them is that there is potential for harm when you take these supplements. So it really is a, a balancing act, but when you get the antioxidants from food from things that have not been adulterated um, then you are getting all I mean all the other benefits from eating those types of foods all the minerals and the other vitamins phytonutrients fiber uh, but simply taking an antioxidant supplement is not going to work unfortunately so it really is about getting a really nutritious wholesome diet lots of fresh fruits veggies whole grains nuts seeds legumes and trying to avoid all of these man-made processed foods that have um, lots of added chemicals in them and doing our best to minimize our exposure to chemicals in our environment. 
Okay, so I hope this has been helpful. If it has, make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos and perhaps share it with friends or family if you think that they would also find it helpful. And don't forget to book in that consultation with me if you would like to know more about the program or if you're interested in joining.